How far would you go for the person you love? Would you, let's say, kill their husband? The early 90s were a confusing time for Billy Flynn. The 15-year-old fell head over heels for an older, married woman. He thought she felt the same way, but if they wanted to be together, they'd have to get rid of her husband first. This is the story of Pamela Smart. Welcome to True Crime Recaps. I'm Chris with all the crime in half the time. If you've got about 15 minutes left on the treadmill, this should fill that time in nicely. And if you know anybody else who likes their crime in half the time, it would mean a lot to us if you gave this a like and shared our channel with them. It really helps us grow, so thank you. It was around 10 p.m. on May 1st, 1990, six days before their first wedding anniversary, and Pamela Smart had just gotten home from a work meeting. She parked next to her husband Greg's truck outside their upscale condo on Misty Morning Drive. But right away, it was clear something wasn't right. All the lights were off. Greg always turned on the porch lamp if he beat her home. She walked up the stairs, unlocked the front door, and stepped inside. There, lying face down in a pool of blood, was her 24-year-old husband. He'd been shot in the back of the head, execution style. The house was ransacked. It looked like a burglary gone wrong. Oddly, Greg still had his diamond wedding ring and wallet. A pair of speakers were piled by the door, and maybe he caught the burglars in the act and paid the ultimate price. Pam ran screaming from the apartment, my husband, my husband, help my husband. She pounded on her neighbor's doors until someone answered. One finally opened up and pulled Pam inside. They thought someone was after her. Everyone living in the Summerhill condominium stood in their doorways. They all had different stories about what was happening. One neighbor assumed Pam's husband was beating her. He asked what was wrong and if she was all right. My husband's on the floor, she answered, pointing back towards Unit 4E. The neighbor ran to the door, but before he could open it, Pam yelled, Don't! There still may be somebody in there. Homicide detectives arrived moments later. The Summerhill condos were only a mile from Derry Police Headquarters. It'd take a band of burglars with some real brass balls to rob and kill a man with the police in their backyard. From the get-go, the captain felt the scene stunk to high heaven. People don't get killed in Derry, New Hampshire. In fact, Greg Smart was the first and only homicide case for Derry police in 1990. People got robbed, but they were few and far between. The killer did a decent job of making it look like a robbery gone wrong, but it wasn't enough to fool the captain. The 24-year veteran had a keen eye for detail. The Smart's condo was full of red flags. There was no sign of forced entry. The Summerhill area was densely populated. Even a nighttime robbery was incredibly risky. And an execution-style killing? Nothing made sense. In his experience, burglars don't like to fight with their victims. They rarely show up with a gun, and they almost never kill anybody. And when they do, it's not execution-style. Whoever killed Greg thought they could stage the crime scene to fool Derry police. According to the FBI, people who stage crime scenes usually mess them up. They arrange the scene based on what they've seen in movies or on TV. They feel stressed trying to get it right and usually get it wrong. The first suspects in any domestic case are those closest to the victim, especially their spouse. But Pam had an ironclad alibi. She was at a school meeting all night, about 40 minutes east of Derry in Hampton, New Hampshire. Whoever killed Greg wasn't here to rob him. If they were, they'd taken his wallet and wedding ring. Whoever killed Greg was here to, well, kill Greg. For Derry police, the burning question was, why? Pam was a pretty girl from Miami, Florida, with dreams of becoming a radio DJ. Her family moved to Derry when she was in 8th grade, but Pam missed life on the beach. She enrolled at Florida State University and hosted a college radio show called Metal Madness. She nicknamed herself the Maiden of Metal. Now, you might be picturing someone with tattoos, piercings, and spiked hair, but... Pam was a delicate blonde who commanded attention whenever she walked into her room. All the boys drooled over her, but only one man got to call Pam his wife. If you saw Greg Smart back then, you'd think he was in Poison or Metallica. He played guitar and sported dark, shoulder-length hair. Pam met Greg at a New Year's Eve party in 1986. They bonded over their love of heavy metal music. They got married in 1989. She was 22, he was 24. 
Friends called the newlyweds' relationship picture perfect. They even had an adorable dog, a Shih Tzu named Halen, in honor of Eddie Van Halen. Less than a year after they married, they moved into the Summerhill Complex in Derry and bought the nicest furniture available. Pam's favorite piece was their white leather couch. The honeymoon phase faded fast. Greg wanted to put his future family ahead of his musical aspirations. He hung up the guitar and took a job working for his father as an insurance salesman. The most dramatic change came when Greg cut his hair. Even though Pam was already starting to feel disillusioned with married life, it was Greg who admitted to being unfaithful. As their one-year anniversary approached, he told her he cheated on her. She felt betrayed. Pam had a communications degree from Florida State University, and she wanted to be a reporter like Barbara Walters, but she landed a gig as a media service director at Winnicunnet High School in Hampton, New Hampshire. The job was a far cry from metal madness. Instead, she had to make educational videos for the school district. She did have her own secretary and student intern, though, so that's a plus. In her spare time, Pam volunteered for a drug awareness program called Project Self-Esteem. All freshmen were required to participate. You can imagine how boring it probably sounded, but Pam made it fun. She was this young, 22-year-old woman who loved heavy metal. Instead of lecturing them about drugs, she'd talk about getting backstage passes and meeting rock stars. A group of students helped out with Project Self-Esteem. Among them was Billy Flynn, a 15-year-old kid who was crushing hard on Pam. When she was introduced to the group, Billy looked at his buddy Vance Latimy and said, I'm in love. Those three little words would prove to be the end of them all. Pam and Billy met shortly after Greg confessed to his affair. She felt more comfortable around the high school kids than she did her own home. She fit in with them. She might have been 22, but she could easily pass as a high school student. She must have seen a young Greg in Billy. He wore a black leather jacket, played guitar, and had that long-haired rocker look she liked. Pam befriended her student intern, too. Cecilia Pierce wanted to be a journalist. She was a good listener who quickly became Pam's pseudotherapist. If there was a problem in Pam's life, Cecilia knew about it. Their relationship took priority. Cecilia's grades slipped as she spent more time with Pam. There were five people in this unlikely and sort of creepy friend group. Aside from Pam, Billy, and Cecilia, there were Billy's friends Vance Latimy and Patrick Randall, but everyone called him Pete. Vance was a dorky kid who loved Edgar Allan Poe and spent his free time fixing an old Camaro. Pete was an athletic kid with a history of skipping school for days on end. There were rumors he wanted to be a professional hitman one day. The core trio was Pam, Billy, and Cecilia. They'd hang out together at the mall and arcades. She'd even invite them over for movies when Greg was out of town or with his friends. The more time passed, the more Pam and Billy fell for each other. Billy thought he was in love with Pam. He couldn't think about anyone else, but in his mind, his love was unrequited. They'd never be together. One day, Pam asked Billy, Do you think of me when I'm not around? Sure, he said. Well, I think about you all the time, she said. The two kissed on Billy's bed with a heavy metal soundtrack playing in the background. Billy could not believe his luck. Little did he know he was just a pawn in a much bigger game. In late March 1990, Greg went out of town for work. Pam invited Billy and Cecilia over to watch Nine and a Half Weeks. Remember that movie? Kim Basinger and Mickey Rourke? If you've never seen it, well... Let's just say Google calls it an erotic romantic drama. And uh, <laughs> Kim Basinger back then? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Pam told Cecilia to take Halen for a walk as the credits rolled. Meanwhile, Pam and Billy went upstairs and had sex for the first time. The next few weeks were full of secret sexual encounters. Pam made one thing explicitly clear. If Billy wanted to keep this up, he'd have to get rid of Greg. But Billy wasn't a dumb kid. He'd asked why she couldn't just divorce him. Pam said she'd lose everything if she left Greg. The condo, the dog, the white leather couch, everything. She lied and told Billy that Greg beat her. He'd probably kill her at the sight of divorce papers. Billy tried and failed to kill Greg twice between March and May, and that's when the gaslighting started. Pam said things like, if you loved me, you'd do this. Billy was afraid of losing her. That's when he roped Vance and Pete into the plan. 
Greg could sense something was off. Pam was out of the house more often than she was in it. And one night in mid-April, Greg walked up to the dark condo and a chill shot down his spine. Something didn't feel right, so he turned around and left. Pam was sick of all the failed attempts. She and the boys hatched a rock-solid plan and set a date for May 1st. She'd leave the back door open before she left for work. Vance Latimy drove the getaway car. Another friend, Ray Fowler, came along for the ride. The boys, dressed in black, would park at a nearby shopping mall and walk over. Bill and Pete would sneak in, ransack the place, and wait for Greg to come home. It would be easy. They only had to stick to Pam's three commandments. Don't turn on the lights. Put the dog in the basement so he doesn't have to watch Greg die. Use a gun, not a knife. Knives are too messy. May 1st began like any other day. Greg left for work, and Pam went to the high school to let Billy know the door was open. They were good to go. Around 8.30 that night, Billy and Pete walked into the smart home and trashed the place. They tossed Halen into the basement and set their sights on Greg's entertainment system. They took everything apart and put the pieces by the back door. All they had to do now was wait for Greg to get home. Billy hid behind the front door while Pete positioned himself on the stairs. They bided their time until Greg's headlights blasted through the window. The engine died, the driver's door opened, and Greg walked up to unlock the front door. He stepped inside and playfully yelled for the dog. Billy ambushed him from behind. Pete held a knife to his throat. It only took a few minutes for the teenagers to get Greg down on his knees to the floor. He handed over his wallet, but refused to give them his wedding ring. He didn't want Pam to be angry. Billy took the borrowed thirty-eight from his waistband and pressed it against Greg's skull. He said, God, forgive me, and squeezed the trigger. Greg died in the hallway while the boys hightailed it out the back door. They ran back to the parking lot where Vance and Ray were waiting in the getaway car. Pam's behavior after the murder set off alarm bells for detectives. They'd seen plenty of grieving widows in their day, and Pam wasn't good at playing the part. When she talked about what happened, she referred to Greg as the body. They escorted her back to the crime scene so she could grab some things. Since only a day or so had passed, it was still being investigated. They hadn't cleaned it up. But it didn't seem to bother Pam. She walked right over the blood-stained carpet like it was nothing. She was more concerned about her dog than catching her husband's killer. For the record, because I can't resist until I know what happened to the dog, here's what happened to Halen. He lived out the rest of his days with Pam's mother. She told Paula Tracy from In-Depth, New Hampshire, when he died, she wrapped him in Pam's favorite t-shirt and buried him in the yard with a picture of Pam and Greg. Everyone in the Derry Police Department believed Pam killed Greg or had something to do with it. Proving it was a different story, but before too long, the plot quickly unraveled. From the very start, the teenage killers were pretty bad at keeping their mouths shut. They told another classmate what happened. He told the police everything they needed to know. Vance's dad showed up at the police station with a 38 caliber revolver. Vance had allegedly stolen his father's gun and given it to Billy to use that night. Later, the boys would tell police Pam gave them the money to buy the bullets. Cecilia was also quick to spill the beans. She'd overheard Pam planning her husband's death with her teenage lover. She agreed to wear a wire and record conversations between her and Pam. Needless to say, Pam didn't think anyone was listening. She tried to convince the girl to lie about what she knew, telling her they'd all go to jail for murder if she told the truth. She went on and on about how stupid the boys were for running their mouths, but it didn't matter because it was her word against theirs, and who would believe a bunch of kids from the bad side of town over her? As it turned out, a jury did. She thought she planned the perfect crime with the perfect patsies, but she wasn't as smart as her last name suggested. Her life as a prisoner began in August 1990, when she was arrested three months after Billy pulled the trigger. Pam's 1991 trial was one of the first to let TV cameras in the courtroom. For reference, the People vs. O.J. Simpson wouldn't happen for another three years. With no physical evidence tying Pam to the murder, the prosecution hung their case on the testimonies of their teenage assassins and the recordings of Pam talking to Cecilia. 
Even with all of that, Pam didn't take any responsibility for what happened. She said, if I was guilty, I would have pled guilty and plea bargained like the rest of them. She claimed she was only acting when she was talking to Cecilia. She was running her own investigation and pretending to know what happened so the teenager would open up. It took the jury 13 hours to find Pam guilty of first-degree murder. She was sentenced to life in prison without parole. She's always insisted she had nothing to do with the murder, and she broke up with Billy long before he shot her husband. As recently as 2019, she told the Washington Post, Billy totally misunderstood the whole thing. She says she told him, I can't, you know, do this because I have a husband. If he translated that into, you know, that he couldn't have me as long as Greg was around, then that's in his brain. That as long as Greg was here, Bill could never have me for himself. The issue for Greg's family is that she's sorry for the affair, but she's not responsible for what Billy did. Greg's picture still hangs in her cell, and for years, she even insisted on wearing her wedding ring. Today, Pam is at Bedford Hills Correctional Facility for Women in upstate New York. It's a medium security prison with some high-profile inmates. Anna Sorokin, a.k.a. Anna Delvey, the New York con artist, was there. Amy Fisher, remember her? The Long Island Lolita? Pam is keeping busy behind bars. She's earned two master's degrees, one in English Lit, one in the Science of Law, and a doctorate in ministry. She works as an inmate HIV counselor, according to the Washington Post. If one of her many bids to get her sentence reduced sets her free someday, she wants to work in HIV prevention with the United Nations. As for the rest of them, Billy Flynn got 40 years, but he only served a little more than half that. He got out in 2015. The last we heard is that he lives in a lovely house in Maine with his wife, who he married while he was still in prison. Patrick Pete Randall also got 40 years, and just like Billy, he was released in 2015. The two guys who waited in the getaway car have also been released. Vance Latamy was paroled in 2005, 15 years after Greg's murder. He's married now, and in 2023, he asked the court to suspend his parole, but they said no. Ray Fowler was paroled in 2003. Cecilia Pierce took a movie deal after the trial and moved to Missouri with her family. As an adult, she moved back to New Hampshire. As of 2016, New Hampshire Magazine says she's still there, married and working as a nurse. Oh, and in case you were wondering, I know I was, Pam did see the movie To Die For during a prison movie night. If you haven't seen it, it's loosely based on her case. Nicole Kidman plays her. Pam is not a fan. And that's your recap. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, go ahead and tap that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss a story. We're here Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but don't go away. Catch up on more recaps right here, right now. Until next time, take care.